Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Easter. We are excited to have you join us here in this digital format. Of course, we hope that soon we can be back to worshiping in person. Be assured that we are taking the measures put forward by Governor Stitt into consideration as far as what we can do and how we can implement certain things to have in-person worship sooner rather than later. At the same time, we do need to be cautious and make sure that we're making wise decisions. But in the meantime, we are thankful to have the opportunity to worship with you in your home or wherever it is that you are worshiping and joining in with us. We pray that this service would be a blessing to you. And if you happen to be in the Oklahoma City area, and especially if you're a member of Holy Trinity or of the Lutheran faith, we would invite you to join us for drive through communion. From 10 a.m. through noon today, we will be having drive through communion. You come up, you'll stay in your car. We give you the goods of Christ's body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you can go on your way and about your day of more social distancing. We can't wait to be able to worship with you in person. But until then, we thank God for the digital means that we have here today and to be able to allow us to worship in this way. God bless your worship here today. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. We worship together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. God, you are for us, not against us. You work together in all things for our good. In the good times, in the bad times, even in pandemic times, you are at work for us and through us for our own good. So let us recognize your gracious working in our lives, confident in the hope that we have in the resurrected Jesus and in the assurance that we have nothing and no one to fear with you by our side. We worship you today, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship in our individual homes, in our cars, in our offices. While we are forced to be apart in these days, we know that through the fellowship of believers, through the preaching of your word, we are bound together with all of your church. So let us honor you in this time of worship, wherever we may be. Fill our homes with the songs of your praises. Fill our minds with deeper knowledge of you and, and how you are working for us. Fill our lips and our mouths with words of forgiveness and love. Fill our hearts with an unwavering faith that stands in awe of you. Bless us, Lord, and draw us closer to one another and to you through this worship. We pray in the name of the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. We continue with our first song, Who You Say I Am.
since we are gathered here to hear God's word and to call on him in prayer and in praise, we take the time to consider our own unworthiness before our holy and righteous God. And we confess to God and to one another that we have sinned in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And we confess that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. We just sang in that song, I was a slave to sin. But we also sang and we confessed and professed with that song that Jesus died for me, that he is for us, not against us. He calls us to confess our sins. And so we lay our sins before God. Together as his people, we take refuge in the infinite, eternal, never-ending mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so I invite you to say aloud with me as a, a statement of confession and seeking God's forgiveness, say this phrase with me, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life in Jesus. Amen. Let's take a moment of silence to reflect and confess personally before God. You know what you've said this week, the things you've done this week, moments of regret, things you wish you could take back. We confess those things, knowing that God was there with you. He sees those things. He knows where you've been, what you've done. And the good news is he loves you anyway. In spite of us, he loves us. And even though we find ourselves wrestling with our sinful condition, wrestling with others, he still loves us and forgives us. For your sake and mine, God sent a savior, his only son, to free us from that slavery of sin. Through his death, Jesus paid the price for sin. And through his resurrection, he gives you and me the promise of new life with him forever. And so as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. We sing our next song, Jesus is better.
sorrows Jesus is better Make my heart believe In every victory Jesus is better Make my heart believe Than any comfort Jesus is better King, but Jesus, Lord of all. Our scripture reading today talks a lot about glory, about this incomparable glory. That's also what Pastor Hinky's going to be preaching on here in a, in a little bit, is this incomparable glory that we don't know what's ahead of us except for something that's good, something that is going to be great. It's going to be glorious. It's what God has in store for us in Christ, that as bad as things might get now on this side of eternity, we have the glory of God to look forward to awaiting us. And so from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30, Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also 
glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our next song, At the Cross.
this time we boldly speak our confession of faith about what we believe about this God of ours, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We use the, the words of an old statement of faith called the Apostles' Creed, and we speak it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The grace, the mercy, and the peace of God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with each one of you. Amen. Well, the words that I'm going to focus on today are from that very lengthy reading that we've already had from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. And I just want to read one verse that's incorporated in there, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You know, whenever we deal with life, I oftentimes go back to the mentor of my life, my mother. In March of this year, she would have been 105 years old. She was too young to remember the great flu epidemic of 1918. She was born in 1915. She grew up on a red, sandy, soiled farm just west of Stillwater that barely ecked out a living, even in good days. As a teenager, she lived through the Great Depression. Life was tough. Provisions were scarce. As farmers, they usually had enough food to get by, and blue bib overalls made up their primary wardrobe to be worn to school and to be worn in the cotton fields as well. Yet, they were better off than most, and they knew it. As she recalled those depression days, there seemed to be a groaning in her voice, a bit of agony still felt after all these years. And then telling these stories would cause her to drift off to tell other stories as well. But these were about the fun times they had with the neighbors, how they would come together and just be kids, how they would make their own fun and their own excitement and with a low, groan-like sigh, she would call them the good old days. Her groan said she missed those days and she longed for them. I think each one of us, no matter what our age might be, longs for, groans for, the good old days. I felt it strange that for my mother, those depression days that were so bad were also referred to by her as the good old days. You know, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, we may be prone to look at the good old days, like the first part of March for us. Before school, distancing, so, social distancing became the thing. Before stores and restaurants closed, before churches closed and went online, and before Holy Communion was served through a drive through under the portico, we may be groaning for days of normalcy, groaning to assemble together again, groaning to worship and sing together, groaning to work at the office again, groaning to let teachers teach our kids, groaning to eat out and be served by someone else, groaning for some peace and some quiet. You know, in Romans 8, 18 to 30, St. Paul talked about groaning. The groaning on the part of all creation, the groaning on the part of the children of God, and also the groaning carried by the Spirit of God to the throne of God. Let's consider for a moment that groaning of all creation. In the good old days, creation didn't groan. God created each detail perfectly. He smiled at it as he saw the perfection and the beauty there were no flaws in his creation, in his design. All creation was in harmony with God. Everything was in its proper order. 
And it was created for the glory of God and for the enjoyment of his human creatures. But creation is now slowly eroding away. We know that full well. Into that perfection came sin. The very human creatures for which God had created this plush world gave in to the devil's temptation and in so doing placed all creation under the bondage to decay. The same judgment that they themselves were experiencing as well. Paul gives creation human qualities, it seems. Draws a picture of creation groaning, groaning for the good old days before sin wrecked it all before the weight of sin pressed it, before pollution and erosion came into the picture, before Satan inflicted his venom, venom upon humankind as well as upon all creation. Creation was collateral damage, so to speak. After all, it was Adam and Eve who sinned. Creation was a victim of sin, now subjected to futility, as Paul says, now subjected to decay. Creation groans in anticipation for something better. Like a woman in labor, he says, when all things will be restored, when the good old days are returned, and when all will be good again. No more thorns, no more thistles, no chaos, no famine, no viruses. You know, the children of God, he says, also groan under sin. We have much about which to groan. Sin has bound us to death and decay. By the sweat of your brow, remember those words. In pain you shall bring forth, remember those words. From dust you were taken to dust you shall return, remember those words. That judgment still hangs over all of us, as well as over creation. We groan under the weight of sin's curse. Like fearful disciples locked in that upper room, they, they knew Jesus was dead Death was to them very final. It was sin's curse. It was easier to, for them to groan over their loss than to see the, with believing eyes the resurrected Christ, the resurrection that he himself had promised and that he accomplished. It's easy to be like the Emmaus disciples, hearing about the resurrected Christ, even hearing eyewitness accounts that they had seen him, but they groaned. On their way back, that seven miles to Emmaus, they groaned with disbelief, unable to believe all that they had heard, rather than rejoicing in the new life that was promised to them and sealed to them through their risen Lord Jesus Christ until he came to them in that upper room, until he came to them along that road to Emmaus and showed himself. Groaning can hinder us trusting God. We groan for what creation groans, the new heaven and the new earth, the new life. Christ's return on the resurrection day, that's what it's all about. That's what we groan for. Paul says it, that on that day will be the redemption of our bodies, the resurrection, the adoption as sons and children sealed for eternity. Christ redeemed us, body and soul. The body is very precious to God as well as the soul. Our bodies are but seeds being planted, Luther wrote, awaiting the completion, waiting to be raised up as plants in a garden, sealed by Christ's resurrection. Meanwhile, we groan in our weakness. We pray, but not as we ought, Paul says, we stumble, we falter in our faith. We may see life as a curse. We may not see any good in life at all. We focus on all, that who, all those things that work against us. Death, life. These are the things that he mentions later on in this chapter. Things present, things to come. There are many things that work against us. The devil, the world, our flesh, coronavirus, fear, death. Even friends and family can be against us. But God doesn't leave us there. The Holy Spirit, whom he gives to us so freely and abundantly, reminds us of the very powerful truth that we are God's children, saints of God. 
Though many might be against us, they can't win. The enemies of our faith can't overcome us because we have the first fruits of the Spirit, he says. We are God's saints cared for by the Holy Spirit. We have been purchased at a great price with the blood of Jesus Christ. He is, has claimed us to be his own. And he doesn't leave us alone. And when we are feeling weak, the Holy Spirit carries our groanings to the throne of God's grace. He intercedes for us. He prays for us. He helps us in our weakness, Paul says. And we are weakened by sin. We struggle for words in expressing our, our concern, our heartfelt feeling. We struggle for words in many ways, and yet we can't find those words oftentimes. We may doubt whether God even hears us. Have you ever been in a situation where you just can't find the words to pray? You hurt so bad that no words come to you? Well, the Holy Spirit is there for us. He is there to help us in our need, in our wordlessness. Paul reminds us that you are not alone. The Holy Spirit helps in time of need. He searches the heart. He takes those groans to the throne of God. He takes them as sweet prayers to him. He intercedes for us because we are God's people. We are his saints made holy by the grace of Jesus Christ. And according to the will of God, he then has a great purpose for us. The Holy Spirit helps us to redefine the view of life situations. You know, with sin, we are prone to view life as an enemy. Life situations aren't out to get us. There's the old thing from the old show from Hee Haw. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Sometimes we feel that way. We cry, life isn't fair. I hate my life. I can't take it anymore. And then the Holy Spirit comes into the picture and redefines our view of life. He who has created faith in our hearts by the grace of Jesus Christ, also in that same faith, enables us to view life's circumstances differently, with confidence, with anticipation, with excitement, with joy, looking forward to the incomparable glory that has been promised to us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You know, my friends, nothing happens by chance. It is always according to God's will, according to God's purpose. And we trust that all things then work together for good to those who love God. If you love him, you trust him. If you love him, you also know that he loves you. That's what Easter is all about, showing us the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. As God so loved the world, so we then are called to rejoice and bask in that love and to share it. He says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Even the groaning negatives in life work together for good, meant to make you stronger. You know, some of you are, will look back on this COVID-19 as a curse, but I have a feeling that some children may look back on this in years to come and to them, they will see the good old days when the family was forced to be together for a month, two months, or whatever it takes, and wishing that those days would come back again where the family could be together. The Holy Spirit intersects our life with blessings. Sometimes that the good that is talked about may not be revealed for many years down the road. But all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And with that word, love the Lord, also trust the Lord. The Holy Spirit has great plans for you. Though many powers and situations may rise up against you, the Holy Spirit is on your side, interceding for you, strengthening you, 
reaffirming you. They can't overcome you. You know, this verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. I had this verse engraved on my wife's tombstone up in Minnesota. She had firmly and faithfully held on to this truth. When her body failed, her eyes, her kidneys, her heart, she couldn't sing in the choir anymore. She couldn't play piano or organ anymore. It would have been easy for her just to give in and give up. But she held firmly to this verse. Even when she no longer could understand the lesson being imposed upon her, she trusted all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And she did. When no energy or breath came to her even to pray aloud, but only to groan and sigh, she knew that her groanings were being taken by the Holy Spirit to Jesus, her mediator, her redeemer, her savior, her risen Lord. My mother also groaned for those good old days. She groaned because of her present reality with leukemia, osteoporosis, emphysema. But she also, as she neared the end of her journey on this side of eternity, she also groaned for what awaited her the incomparable glory that had been promised to her through our Lord Jesus Christ, the same glory that my wife also groaned for. You know, my friends, there's a new day coming when creation stops groaning, and us too, when Christ returns to restore all things, when no longer will we see by faith but by sight, when we shall no longer groan for the good old days, but joyfully live in the new day of God's salvation, sealed to us by his powerful truth that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sealed to us in such a way, in such a powerful way, that we can say with confidence, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God's peace to you. And remember, my friends, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That's his promise. Cling to that promise and await that incomparable glory that has been promised to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may that peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please join me in prayer as we pray for all of God's people in Christ Jesus and all others around the world according to their needs. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, you hear the groanings of creation and the groanings of our heart, and so we lift up so many countless things that are weighing on our hearts and on our minds today. Lord Jesus, how our hearts have burned within us as we have heard your word and we have heard your message proclaimed to us. We ask that you would keep our faith kindled and prevent it from growing cold ever. Grant us the grace to never waver in our faith or to give in to temptation. Give us hearts that are receptive so that we may give, have ears to hear your word and upon hearing it, we may believe in you as Lord and in believing that we would be firm in this faith and hope all our days. For you have claimed us you have cleansed us with water and the word in our baptism, O oh Lord. So we ask that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit to live out this faith and holy living, lifting up your name in word and in works for as long as we live, pressing on toward the glory which awaits all your saints in Christ. Bless your whole church on earth, Lord, here and around the world. Gather together all those who are separated in these days and preserve our faith by your word until all of the precautions and all the shelter measures have been passed. God, we pray for Matthew Harrison, president of our synod, for Barry, our district president, and for all pastors and church workers here and abroad. 
bless those who are training for church work vocations, but especially we pray for those seminarians who will be placed in vicarage assignments and first calls as pastors this week. We especially pray pray for those two men who will be placed here at Holy Trinity. Lord, we ask that you would bless them and guide them and prepare the way for them. And bless each of us as well in the priesthood of all believers so that we would live out our baptismal vocation of loving you, loving one another in the body of Christ and loving our neighbor. God, you are the Lord of life. And so we pray for our members who are celebrating birthdays this week, including Kristen Herm, Alexis Hill, Kathy Miller, Drew Terrell, Royce Bartlett, Jordan Hoven, Denise Howard, Louis du- Neendorf, Haley Dewitt, Daxon Hedrick, Lane Hill, James Lawson, Jack McHugh, Isaiah Newkirk, Darren Winkler, Drew Bales, and John Payne. You have graciously called and claimed each of them in baptism. So let them continue to experience your blessings and may they be a blessing through every aspect of their earthly life. And guard our nation, O Lord, so that we would enjoy peace and security in the face of every threat and danger. Bless our president and governor, as well as our national and state legislators and local officials, that they may fulfill their offices faithfully. And bless all emergency and medical workers and the members of the armed forces who protect us and teach the nations your ways of peace. God, you are the Lord of love. So we pray for those who are celebrating marriage blessings this week as they celebrate anniversaries, including Jake and Kim Barnhart and Curtis and Rena Vickery. Let the love of each of these couples grow stronger for one another and for you through every joy and every sorrow they experience until finally one shall lay the other into your arms for eternity. God, we ask that you would deliver us from all of our afflictions. Grant us the strength to bear all of our burdens. We especially ask that you would be with Dick Anderson, Reagan Beatty, Sarah Critchfield, Fern Herman, Jim Hutchison, Philip Isett, Larry Urcheski, Louise Main, Jerry Parkinson, Dennis Paul, Gary and Michelle Quick, Ruby Ross, and all others whom we name in our hearts. According to your gracious will, we ask that you would heal the sick, relieve those who suffered and comfort the grieving, and give peace to the dying. Stay with us, Lord, and be our strength in all our weakness, and be our hope in times of despair. God, your gracious will has so often kept the saints in the faith, even unto death, and so we ask that you would keep us with them in your faith, so that we may be found faithful when Christ comes again in his glory to bring fulfillment to all things once and forever. Until that day, Lord, we pray that you would grant to us all the things for which we pray in the name of Jesus and for the sake of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to, command, to observe all that I have commanded you. Love God, love one another, and love your neighbor. To God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in his holy church forever and ever. Amen. Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ shall come again. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is is risen risen indeed. Alleluia. We sing our closing song forever.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah.